Thank everyone for coming. It's really nice to see a really packed room. We have first years, second years, graduates, future MBAs in 50 years. Or so. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really nice to have you, everybody here. Thank you for coming. Tonight we are going to hear about uh, some some stories about Pedro. Pedro is coming from Mexico. He graduated here in 2002. It was really a tough time because he, just after he started, started his second year, we had September 11. So the job market at this time, you imagine how it was. Now it's tough, that time was tough as well. He's going to, to share also a little bit of his experience in that. Uh, today he's the, he started his work in Toyota here in the United States. Today he's the CEO, COO of uh, the Toyota plant in Mexico. He was one of the people who started the business there in Mexico. He was also part of the Global Experience, Global Experience Academy. Academy with Professor Garcia at the time he was here. So he has a lot to do, lots in common with us in his past. So now he's talking about what he's done so far and the story of Toyota. So please welcome. Thank you. Barra. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, if, if you agree with me, I'll, I'll jump to the presentation about Toyota. And uh, as, as per Eduardo's request, at the end, maybe I can share with you some of the things that I leave uh, when I was here. As, as, he, as he said, uh, when I was here in my first year, the market was great. I had, I had even three job offers for the internship. Everything was good, no, no concern, no worries. But right after we came from the internship, uh, the September 11 happened. And believe me, it changed dramatically the landscape <coughs> for MBAs. And, I, I, and I would like to, at the end to share with you some of the things that, uh, that, I, that I did that worked very well for me to, to be able to, to find a job. Uh, but as I said, let's move first into the Toyota presentation. Uh, just as a comment, uh, the title that uh, Kelly put to, to the, my presentation is how Toyota conquered the Mexican market. I work for a company that doesn't like you to be very presumptuous about your results. Uh, they don't like you to say things like this. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, so please uh, keep the title for, for Kelly only. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to find any trouble with any Japanese working in Toyota. So, no, but more, more than happy. Uh, it's, I had a, a huge opportunity in starting Toyota in Mexico. Uh, I will explain a little bit of that, but uh, incredible as, as it seems, Toyota wasn't in Mexico, but until 2002, which was basically the year when I graduated from Cali. I'll share with you the, the story. Why don't we start with the background? Uh, first, uh, let me tell you, let me, let me share a little bit uh, what was going on in Mexico at the time. Uh, not everybody here is familiar with Mexico. And uh, Mexico is, uh, is, an, is kind of an interesting uh, country. Um, I'm sure you have all heard of the tequila crisis that happened in 1995, or maybe you have read it, read it in, in a book. But Mexico, prior to 1990, Mexico was a very closed market, almost no, no free trade agreements. Uh, the economy was uh, mostly local. A uh, big part of the GDP came from oil exports. Uh, about after 1990, the landscape started changing dramatically. And from 1990 to 1994, uh, Mexico was growing at, at a fast pace by opening its barriers to other markets, becoming uh, much more of a global uh, player. And, uh, and I will start thinly comparing versus 1995. We were here about to launch Toyota in 2001. But it was interesting to see what happened from 1995 to, to 2001. Uh, GDP in 1995 was pretty bad, but it started recovering. And as you can see in this chart, uh, it was recovering gradu uh, gradually. It, it, it was, uh, it, we were certain that it was going to keep growing. But the most important thing out of that is that the GDP per capita, coming from a very uh, somehow a poor country, was, was growing, especially the middle class was growing very heavily. And this is very, very important for, for an automotive uh, company because 
uh, it is really the middle class the one who drives the market. Uh, the more the middle class is in a position to buy a vehicle, the more interesting is is for an automotive company. So even when this this uh, amount wasn't there as an ideal market, it was growing at a fast pace, and certainly it was the time to to take a bet on on Mexico. Uh, two more things: uh, unemployment has always been low in Mexico, fortunately, but at the time it was two. 2.42. The worst one we had for the last 30 years was this one, 6% in 1995, but uh, unemployment was at record lows of 2.4 at the time. Mexico in that year was number one GDP in Latin America. Uh, almost always uh, Brazil has been the number one economy as it is right now. Uh, Mexico has always been second, but that particular year uh, Brazil wasn't doing very well and Mexico came up to, do, uh, to, to become the number one Latin America country. Also in 2001, you'll see again tequila crisis, inflation 52%, basically. You can imagine that. Uh, you didn't want to have cash in your wallet, trust me. Uh, by 2001, we were at 4.4. This, was, this, was, this didn't have a precedent in Mexico. We, we had like 30 years without seeing an inflation like this. It's, uh, for the last uh, previous 30 years, basically, Mexico had been with very high inflation rates. And international reserves, one of the problems of the tequila crisis is, is that Mexico ran out of, of international reserves. But at the time, uh, it was in, in uh, recovering and with a path of, of getting much stronger. And finally, uh, risk rate at the time was 308 versus 842 in, in 1995. But the good thing about that is that it was improving. Uh, and proof of that is that uh, rates, T-bill rates, government, government uh, bill, uh, T-bills were at levels of 11%. Sounds pretty high, but trust me, uh, these, these uh, instruments uh, quote uh, maybe at 68% in 1995. So the, the, the economy was getting stronger. Uh, another very interesting thing is that Mexico has not only has a huge strategic location when, when you're next to the most important economy in the world, but in addition to that, Mexico had a uh, free trade agreement with North America that we all know. Uh, Mexico had also a free trade agreement with Europe. It was about to sign a free trade ag agreement with Japan, ideal for a company like Toyota. And, uh, and it had for many years basically free trade agreement with most of Central and, and South America. So if you think of Mexico as a manufacturing base, uh, it's ideal climate because you can export uh, without barriers to almost every country around. Um, the other money market, uh, this is important, Mexico at the time was the 10th largest, Mexico was the 10th largest automotive manufacturer and was the 11th largest automotive market with sales at the time near 850,000 units, which by the way, that's very similar to what we're going to do this year. Uh, for many years, it, 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 it uh, surpassed the million barrier, but uh, with the crisis the, that started in 08, it came, all, it came down to below a million. And, and uh, is, the market was basically dominated by the big five. And we call, this is odd uh, if you are used to the US market, but big five in Mexico meant five players that had been there for years. And those players are basically GM, Nissan, Chrysler, Ford, and um, VW. And those players had been there for years. As I said, it was a very close market. But these, these guys, uh, or these players had very strong manufacturing uh, capabilities in Mexico and basically dominated the market for decades. But suddenly, as Mexico opened its barriers, uh, many more uh, entrants came. Uh, and believe it or not, we were about the last entrant in the market when we started operations in 2002. Uh, one interesting thing is that uh, at the time, there were more brands in Mexico than in the US. We have around 37 brands in Mexico. So this was very interesting. In pre-1990, you only had five brands, maybe some others with those same makes. But uh, just 10 years after, we had more brands than almost every other country. So it was a kind of a competitive landscape, uh, difficult to, to challenge. And your question will be, why Toyota decided to enter the Mexico market until that time? 
Well, this, this wasn't the first attempt of Toyota in Mexico. Toyota uh, tried to start operations or basically establish a small assembly plant in Mexico in the early 60s. And, uh, and at the time, uh, uh, we didn't have the right product. It was uh, Toyota Pet Crown. Toyota Pet Crown is famous at Toyota because it was a very low quality vehicle. <laughs> it, it failed in, in here in the US. It failed in Mexico too. Uh, Toyota didn't do, it was a very green company uh, in the global scenario. Toyota didn't do well with the government. Uh, and two years after, Toyota decided to leave Mexico. It was until 2001 that finally the, the decision was approved to launch Mexico the, the year after in 2002. And trust me, all those Japanese executives that were handling Toyota operations in 1964, we had to wait until they retired <laughs> or they passed away because they just didn't want to see anything regarding Mexico. So, but finally, but I cannot complain because this was a very good time for me. So uh, what did a Mexican think of Toyota in 2001? Well, we saw a lot of trucks like this, very old. Uh, when you move into rural areas, you could see in the country uh, some Toyota pickups that were uh, illegally imported, but the, almost there was no other brand that, that had uh, old pickups like this. So basically, many people in Mexico tried to import even illegally these pickups because they were very reliable, very durable. So there was some somehow uh, feeling that Toyota had, did very good products in terms of dependability. In addition to that, uh, if you ask almost any other Mexican, what do you think when Toyota comes to your mind? Some will tell you SUVs, some others uh, will tell you pickups, like the ones we saw in Mexico, and some others will have uh, more idea that Toyota was one of, at the time, the third lar largest manufacturer, uh, auto manufacturer in the world. So having said all of that, uh, let me speak a little bit about what was the competitive landscape. And as MBA, you will start uh, noticing some of the <coughs> opportunities that we had at the time we launched. Well, as I said, the market was dominated by the big five. Uh, number one at the time was GM, followed by Nissan. These two, for more than a decade and still uh, today, have been number one and two, they vary each year. Uh, it may be surprising for you to hear Nissan is, is one of the most important players in Mexico. Nissan, Mexico for Nissan is the third largest market in the world for Nissan, uh, just after Japan and, and the US. Uh, Nissan has been there for years. It has a huge manufacturing base and it has been very successful basically producing uh, low-cost vehicles that do very well in, in Mexico. Honda had been in the market since 1995. At the time, it had been in the market for six years. And as you can see, <coughs> still with a huge gap to the, to the big players. Others, and these are basically the other entrants and, and also luxury, luxury makes, only did for this amount. So basically, 93% of the market was still dominated by the big five. And uh, can you see this slide? Uh, I was talking to you about uh, manufacturing presence. Basically, those big five had uh, a huge manufacturing presence, mostly in central Mexico. And this is very important because uh, in Mexico, uh, all the supplier base, not only for Mexico, but also supplier base that exports to the US is located in this area of Mexico. When you are an auto manufacturer, the first thing you need to look at when you establish uh, a plant is where are the suppliers. That, that's the number one rule. The more you minimize the distance uh, with your suppliers, the better your costs will be. So that's, why the, that's the reason why most, it's mostly entrenched here. Some of these in the north are a little bit far away from the center, but it had to do a reason that these plants were mostly for exporting to the US. Uh, competitors positioning. And here we have basically three, three major areas. Uh, the first one is the big five. They offer, they were big volume players uh, with, uh, with uh, low cost uh, prices or low pricing mostly. Most of the products what they sold were uh, low cost. Then you have the new, the new entrants, the niche players, mostly Europeans. Mexico is a kind of 
on the one hand, is uh, very influenced by North America, by, by the US, uh, especially in the north of Mexico. But it, it also has an important presence from Europe. So these niche players, mostly European, uh, succeeded in attacking uh, one, one special niche with low volume and attractive price. And finally, you have the luxury, the premium plates that were, of course, low volume but high price. I will only speak up separately about Honda. Honda was kind of like with these niche players, but doing much better than them. So Honda was something very interesting for us to study. And uh, here in the US, it's also one of our most important competitors. But Honda was showing us that perhaps the opportunity was to be not with those others, but in this particular area. Toyota had products that we could sell in Mexico at a certain premium price. Uh, we could, we have a big lineup. We can eventually offer important volume, but we couldn't compete in low cost vehicles like this because all of these had manufacturing base. They could produce locally. They, they really had very, very uh, low uh, cost manufacturing. So we, we definitely couldn't compete with these guys. Competitor dealer body, this is the number of dealerships. <laughs> Again, the big five dominate the number of dealerships in Mexico. Uh, number one is I had 224 dealerships. And, and all these, most of these were the new entrants. This, this was in 2001, this was like 2004, we were already there. But this is just to show you an idea on how uh, the big five dominated the number of dealerships in Mexico. Uh, some other important points. Dealer, dealer profitability was declining. When you were one of the big five at those times where you were the only players and you had only maybe four products to offer, it was easy to sell, to sell at, a, at a good price, at a premium price. But when you have a lot of entrants and now you sell, instead of four products, you sell perhaps 15 products, uh, and you have the same, num the same number of facilities, uh, is you start finding yourself overrepresented. And that's what, that was the case with the specialty big five. Poor, poor parts and service, uh, and service performance. Customers in Mexico were always very disappointed of what happened at the workshop, in the, in the service shop. Always problems. There was no, the, the way dealers saw the service operation was, it's something I must do, but my business is to sell new vehicles. So you can uh, see that the, the, customer, the, the way they attended customer wasn't very good. Push system in vehicle allocation, uh, enforce manufacturers to spend big amounts uh, of incentives. What happened, what happened normally with the traditional manufacturers, they produce uh, a batch of, let's say, uh, uh, 5,000 vehicles in the month. You put them into your local market. If they, mo if they do well, no problem. But if, if you only sell 3,000, you already have secured the 5,000 units in production for the next many months. So you better do anything to sell the remaining balance, the, the other 2,000 vehicles, if you don't want to increase your inventories at a very dangerous level. So what was happening at the time is more products and more competitors, they were enforced to put a lot of money in incentives so they could uh, really turn their products. And finally, uh, many dealerships were old. Uh, many of the dealerships of the B5 were second or third generation. Sometimes second and third generations are good, sometimes they are not. Uh, but it's always uh, very difficult for a manufacturer to cancel a dealership. And there were many dealerships that, that didn't do very well. So here's how we started Toyota Mexico. And maybe your number one surprise is that I'm not going to tell you many sweet things about the first year. We did a lot of mistakes, but I will, I will point out those mistakes at the end of this section. Well, the initial objectives were like, almost any other company that starts operation in a new country. We wanted to establish brand awareness. We had to establish an organization, build customer satisfaction. Uh, this was uh, given our geographic location, we were to import only products from North America, basically, only products produced in North America. We were going to import all parts from the US. I will explain this in detail later. Uh, we wanted to establish a profitable dealer network. Uh, we wanted to set up government and public re uh, relations, build UIO. UIO uh, stands for units in operation, which are the units that you sold that are in the market. 
We didn't care really about service. You're starting. There's no service uh, almost at the very beginning. So we, we, well, we basically said, we, we will care about service when we are three years old or four years old. It's no time to do that. Uh, so having said these main object, uh, objectives, let me explain uh, what was the corporate structure. And this is very, very unique of Toyota. No other manufacturer has a, a, a corporate structure like this. And with this, I'm not saying that this is very good or not. It's just different. For some things, it's good. For some others, it's not. But uh, basically, you have here TMC, which is Japan. Then you, have a, you had a holding company in the US called TMNA, uh, Toyota Motors uh, North America. Then you have, there, there were many subsidiaries of, of the holding company, but basically the two most important are TMS, which is uh, Toyota Motor Sales, uh, basically handles all the sales operation in the country. You have the manufacturing side, Toyota Motors Manufacturing North America. They, they are in charge of the plants. And you had TFS, the financial arm of Toyota. And basically, they replicated the same structure for Mexico. Uh, I will speak of this in a, in a minute, but they were to set a plant in, in Mexico, in Tijuana. And, uh, and we were Timex. Basically, we handled all the sales operation, plus government relations, plus public relations. We did many things. Basically, we did almost everything that had, we had to do as a business in Mexico, except handling directly the plant that was to open. Um, and here I'm going to talk about the plant. Remember I said that you have to be close to your supplier base? <laughs> and maybe I didn't say it, but about 70% or 80% of the, of the market of your consumers are here. Well, don't ask me from what office this decision came from Japan, but... <laughs> Try to find the farthest point in the country, <laughs> and, and, and you'll make it. Uh, and so when we were about to start operations, we, we were informed that uh, TMC decided to put a plant in Mexico. This was great news, uh, a bittersweet news when they said in Tijuana. But uh, the reason why they did that is basically Tacoma was going to be mostly for North America. It, we were going to export about Every, most of the Tacomas, or about 90% of the Tacomas we produce, were for export to California and the west side of the US. They were, at the time, there was a very strong demand of Tacomas, and, uh, and, and that was the, the rationale of the decision. This is a deci decision that years after, uh, you can conclude that it was a very bad decision. But at the time, there were reasons why, why they decided to do that. This was the headcount, just, just to explain very quickly. It was a very, very, very simple headcount. Maybe what, what I'm going to point out is that uh, we were a subsidiary of Toyota Motor Sales USA. This was, on the one, on the one hand, it, this was a very good news because we could count with all the resources and experience from Toyota Motor Sales USA. The bad, the bad thing about that is that uh, all the US executives didn't have global experience, so they this was their first experience launching the brand in another country. And, and as you may see, Mexico is a very, very, very different country than in the US. So we, it was, on the one hand, very good, because really uh, Toyota Motor Sales has supported us tremendously. But on the other hand, it was very, very difficult to <coughs> explain uh, TMS how it worked. As the first Mexican who started working for, for Toyota Mexico, uh, it was very interesting, trust me, to explain uh, our US friends how an invoice was done in Mexico, what social security meant in Mexico, definition, very basic definitions. You come from, from your MBA to talk about a strategy, very enthusiastic, <laughs> and you end up explaining for four months what's social security, how the accounting works in Mexico, how the government. Yeah, it's, it, it was really tough, but at the same, at the same time, it was, it was very good because it, it brought us a lot of good practices and synergies. And this is another interesting thing. Uh, the initial lineup, the, the lineup that we launched in the very first year, are products that you know very well. Uh, we, we launched with the Camry. Originally, we were going to launch in April 1st, 02, with Camry and Corolla. For us, for us Corolla, Corolla is an important segment in Mexico. <coughs> Unfortunately, a few months before launching, uh, we were told that the Corolla 
launch <coughs> of this new generation suffered a, de a delay. We had to launch only with Camry. By, the, by late that, that year, we also had Matrix and, and Forerunner. Uh, but seriously, this was not the ideal lineup to launch in Mexico. We started the first year with four dealerships. Uh, one in Monterrey, one in Guadalajara, and four in Mexico City. These three cities together account for about 50% of the Mexico economy. Uh, so especially Mexico City accounts for about 35% of the market, <coughs> while Guadalajara and Monterrey together with Mexico City account for the 50%. So we had to be in those, in those uh, markets. And one interesting thing, one of those things you don't expect uh, in day one, we received around 700 applications to become Toyota dealer in Mexico. More than 700 applications. Uh, honestly, you ask yourself, well, we announced what was the minimum investment. When you receive 700, you say, where's, where's, where's that money? I mean, in, that we have 700 applicants asking for a Toyota dealer. That was very nice. I mean, it's, uh, we, we really had a pool of applicants where we could uh, take, uh, basically select the best possible entrepreneurs for opening the Toyota dealerships. <coughs> and basically, this is the image of our first year uh, dealerships. We, we created uh, a special image for Toyota in Mexico. Uh, at the time, the US image was already uh, old. The Japan image was, wasn't good. So we had to create basically our own image. And, and in that, we did, we did basically very well. This was the, the ad or the spot that we, this was our very first campaign. I want you to see it. It was a good campaign. I will explain what were the flaws. Oops, sorry. Let me just show it to you. There comes a subtitle. This was our first campaign. We basically had been in the market for a year. The products you saw there were the products we basically had. Uh, and uh, it was a, a, a good campaign in terms of a message, but uh, didn't deliver the, the uh, did, or di didn't provide the brand with a, with a sole identity in the market. Still, we had uh, consumers or, or people thinking of Toyota of something very different. So this was also one of the challenges after that first year. So just talking about the first year evaluation, we did a very good dealer selection. We, we basically selected the best possible dealers in the country. I will explain this later. We established a one price policy, meaning that all dealers sold at the same price. They were enforced to sell at the same price. Uh, the lineup was on the one hand good, on the one hand it wasn't as good because <laughs> If you launch a Toyota in Mexico with the Camry, number one selling car here in the US, but it represents about only 4% of the total market in Mexico, it is not the right product you want to launch. So uh, the lineup wasn't really appropriate for, for, Mexico, for Mexico needs. Uh, dealer relationships, I will explain that later. Facilities, there is a little bit of that. We started with very good customer satisfaction. But it's, easy to it's very easy to have good levels of customer satisfaction when you sell, uh, when your volume is very small, when you have very few products to, to sell. <coughs> you can imagine that when a customer comes into the, into the showroom, all the sales reps come like this uh, to offer their best services. So we, we, we were not uh, taking that into account as a, as a positive thing, although at least we can say that we started with good levels of customer satisfaction. Dealer training was very good. 
I explain this manufacturing location. Uh, limited global experience from, from, from the team that was set to launch, to launch the brand in Mexico. Uh, the real dealer rollout planning, I will explain this later. The advertising was not bad, but it, we were not building brand ident identity. So we had to, to come back to the desk and, and reshape the, the strategy. This is, this, is, this is incredible when I see backwards, but if you were a dealer and you had a customer in your service shop that needed a part, a part you, your, next, your next step was to come into a computer to order from a part distribution center in, in, in maybe in, in the US to, to, to ship that uh, part by air to Mexico. You can imagine that this was very, very, very costly. It lead time was very high. So this was also another huge challenge that we had for if we, if we were gonna, wanted to be <coughs> successful. And therefore, parts arrival time it was also a very big problem. So one of the things that I can say uh, after working uh, many years with Toyota is this is a company that uh, commits mistakes, important mistakes sometimes. But this is a company that uh, its strength re uh, relies on, on the way uh, it always comes, uh, uh, turns around those, those errors. And that's part of the culture of Toyota. Toyota has a culture basically based on Kaizen. And everybody at Toyota is always uh, challenging, challenging you to, to do things better. Uh, I was saying in joke that uh, how Toyota conquered the Mexican market, I don't want that to see by executives, by executives because it sounds arrogant. I mean, that's totally against the Kaizen culture. In the Kaizen <coughs> culture, you have to talk about the opportunities you have to improve, but never about uh, success you had. So uh, as, as Toyota in the world, uh, we, we had to play uh, big uh, amounts, big uh, hour, a lot of hours to, to do Kaizen. And I'll talk uh, in the next slides about uh, what were those things we did uh, that helped us turn around uh, the operation. Number one, we need to rank priorities. Um, when you're a dealer in Mexico, as in most parts of the world, the, what is not nice of being a, a dealer is that on the one hand, you have to treat your customer in the best possible way. But on the other hand, you have to also treat your supplier, basically the manufacturer, also the best possible way. Uh, the, the world of the dealer is no, nobody, nobody ever tries to be good with you. You're the one who is enforced or entitled to, to treat everybody fairly because uh, the manufacturers have uh, a lot of power and you always want to be in good terms with them so they, they may give you a better allocation of vehicles or they may give you another dealership. So it's, it's kind of a tough world and, uh, and therefore, and, and what this creates when you're, when you're a manufacturer and your customer who is your dealer uh, tries, treats you all the time the best possible way, it's very easy to become arrogant because you, you don't have any, anybody to treat as customer. So uh, you, you are not humble most of the times. So we needed to change that. Uh, we wanted dealers to attend customers, but uh, we didn't want them to spend hu uh, huge, uh, many hours to, to treat us, to try to be in good terms with us. So. Uh, we basically, as a solution, we had to rank customer first, dealer second, and Toyota third. What this meant is that all every Toyota effort in the market was going to be focused on what is good for the customer. But since we don't wear, work directly to the customer, since we don't sell vehicles that are directly to the customer, our efforts were to be in supporting dealers in as many ways as we could. And the result is this. This is the rationale of Toyota. If a Toyota dealer feels ent enthusiasm, <coughs> he, will transmit, he will transmit it to the customer. If the customer and dealers do well, Toyota will. This sounds very philosophical, but believe me, if you start doing that, if you, if you really focus your efforts in supporting your dealer the best possible way, things will give you much better results because that's the same way in which they, in which they will treat customers and they will transmit the philosophy you want them to transmit. And this is, this is a base of the Toyota philosophy. 
And when you see the log of Toyota, it means basically this. Toyota working for the dealer for the benefit of the customer. So uh, this was very important to set. Believe me, nobody in the market saw things as we were saying here. Number two, vehicle lineup. As I said, if you see North America and you think of US and Canada, uh, you think Camry is the number one selling car. You think that trucks, trucks are the most important segment, trucks meaning uh, pickups. But that was not essentially the case in Mexico. In Mexico, we needed other types of vehicles. So uh, we looked forward to be able to import vehicles from other sources, uh, like Japan, uh, where we could uh, place the right vehicles for the Mexican market. And, and the result of that, this is the first year that we saw. But fortunately, in the years after, we could, we could meet customer expectations for the ones that were expecting SUVs and for the ones that were expecting trucks. So as, as the more we diversified our lineup, the better we were able to handle each segment. That was pretty straightforward. But uh, this one is more, is more important. Uh, when you talk about one price policy here in the US, you call it collusion. And it's illegal. In Mexico, you, it could be illegal if, if you have a dominant position in the market. But since we, we don't have, or any other auto manufacturer, nobody has a dominant position in the market, uh, you can sell at the same price. What normally happens in, when you go to a dealership, I, I'm sure everybody has lived this experience, you come and you want, to de you want to deal for a vehicle. But you very well know deep inside you that if you go to the other dealership of the same brand, you, you will try to deal that. Maybe that, that will give you a better price. And maybe you will end up paying that price that the second dealer gave you. But I insist, deep inside of you, you will always feel like if you had gone to the third or the fourth or the fifth dealership, you may have got even a better deal. This is a sickness in the automotive market, and we wanted to walk away from that in Mexico. And let me explain. Uh, in addition, when you are a dealer and your colleague, your other dealer of the same brand, when I'm competing all the time against you, we are the same brand and we are competing, uh, offering a better price for the customer all the time, all the time. We're not going to be friends. I mean, we're really enemies. But if you are, let's say, Ford, and, uh, and you want, and uh, as, a, as Ford, you are worried in competing maybe against Chevrolet. But your dealer is not competing against Chevrolet. Your dealer is really competing against your other dealer. This is a sickness because the, your, your interest is, is not aligned. You as a manufacturer want your dealers uh, competing versus your competitors and not among them. And this one price policy is the best way to avoid that. If we were able to enforce a one price policy uh, through, throughout all of our dealers nationwide, we could handle, we could align the interest of the manufacturer and we could, and we could uh, create very good relationships with, among our dealers that we needed Good relationships among your dealers is the best thing you can do in order to, to be able to negotiate, to, to uh, take decisions jointly with them, uh, that I will explain in detail a little bit later. And when we talk about one price policy, that doesn't mean that it's a fixed price necessarily. That means that we all sell at the same price. But if the market isn't there and we need to lower the price or put an incentive, we all do it at the same time. And that, that was basically the mechanics of the one price policy. So as a result, this was perhaps the most important result. When you train your sales reps to sell the benefits of the product <laughs> instead of dealing price, and you train your customer, because it takes time also, also to, to, to train your customer. If you secure your customer that the price is the same, regardless of what dealer he goes. So the conversation between sales rep and customer 
is on the product. And the more you talk about the benefits of the product, the better your customer will be in terms of satisfaction. So it, it creates a, a good a virtuous, virtuous cycle? Virtuous circle. Vir, virtuous circle, sorry. So and, uh, that's, that was what we were looking for. Another important opportunity, new market rep strategy. At the, at the end of year one, we basically opened six dealerships without any fundamental strategy underneath. And uh, as I said, bad relationships among same brand dealers happen everywhere in, the, in every country in the, in, in, in the world. Uh, what, what also happens normally when you don't, when you don't set clear rules? Uh, let's say I'm, I'm the Toyota dealer in Bloomington, Indiana. If I want to do better this month, I know that Bloomington is not going to buy me more Toyotas. So why don't I start doing some marketing activities in Bedford? But there's another dealer in Bedford. Who cares? I, the more customers I pull out from him, the, the better I will sell. So there's a lot, a lot of uh, unfair play normally among dealers. And that hurts the customer, always. So uh, we needed to establish a very strong market representation strategy that makes policies clear and that provides certainty to dealers. Uh, let me explain. Uh, we appointed territories or areas to each dealer. And we gave them, let's say, uh, a, a geographic map, and we told them, you can only perform sales and marketing activities in this area. If I see you doing sales activities somewhere else, you'll get fined. I, I may cancel your franchise, or I may do something else. Once you provide that certainty to the dealers, really you are providing them the opportunity to, to focus in their, in their market area, compete versus your competitor, and, and forget what the other Toyota dealer is doing. Another bad habit of the manufacturers is normally manufacturers measure dealer performance on sales, only on sales. Basically, I'm always happier with the dealer that does the, the major volume of sales. And that, ha that shouldn't be the case. It should be the other way around. I should, I should award customer satisfaction. And as a result of customer satisfaction, Sales will come. That's the way we needed to make our dealers think. And that was what we called uh, the FIT strategy, uh, which basically FIT stands for FIT into territory. This was very huge. This was something that nobody had done in Mexico at the time. And it really made our dealers very happy. They had certainty. They know wh what was their, uh, they very well know the market where they should focus their attention. and forget about what other Toyota dealers were doing. Uh, and believe it or not, we split Mexico into 64 territories. Uh, that doesn't mean that we opened those six, 64 territories. We haven't opened yet many of them. But uh, if I gave, let's say, this orange area, the customer, the dealer there, uh, in, in time, they could open maybe uh, a branch or a, or, another, or a satellite operation. But they will always focus in this area. The, if they sell or do something, when I mean sell is perform marketing or sales activities or promotions or ads. If they did anything in this other area, we intervene. And, 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 and it has happened. We, were, uh, we, were, uh, we recently closed one dealership for doing that. But the certainty that you give to the dealers is just great. And this is another very important thing of our strategy. We decided to open one Toyota dealership in an area. Uh, assume this, this uh, square is this, is this orange area. Where our plan was to open only one dealership. Nissan opened fi had five in that area. Uh, Chevrolet had five, Ford had four, uh, VW had five, and Honda had two. If you want your dealers, because imagine all, the, all these Dealers are different owners. If in, a very, if in a small area you open so many dealerships, again, you will have that, that effect that I've been talking about. <coughs> you don't want your dealers competing heavily and unfairly among them. So when you only have one Toyota dealer, we could, in reality, we could, the, the customer satisfaction doesn't get hurt 
because you have less, uh, less outlets. Uh, if you do well your job, really the customer is never going to feel the pain of having to, to, to travel longer distances to, to service their vehicle. At the end of the day, you have to service your vehicle at most twice a year, so they don't really feel it. Number five, create a dealer association. Uh, this is not the common practice, but uh, basically what we did is, together with the dealers, we established a dealer association so we had a channel to, to negotiate or, ag or agree or take decisions, market decisions with the dealers together. And uh, this was very important too, because uh, if, you, as, if you as a company only have one channel of communication, believe me, you are in much better than having to deal with, for instance, the 63 dealers we have right now. So uh, it's a very good way to ask the dealers to agree among them on, on how they want to handle the market, taking decisions about incentives, taking decisions about product, taking decisions about financing <laughs> rates. Uh, we, we established only one, one channel in which previously to sitting with us, they all agreed on what they were going to ask Toyota. And this was very efficient and has been very, very good for us. I'm running a little bit faster because I see time is running up. Well, we talked about uh, where we wanted to position. The point was that we wanted to position differently for competitors based on the products or on the lineup we had and based on, on, the, brand on, on, on the brand values. At the end, as you expect, we, we decided to position here. But the most important thing here is Toyota had products that were near premium and we had mass market products. We started mostly, for Mexican standards, we started basically uh, sell, selling mainly premium products. Because that way, we were going to set, set an image for the brand. So little by little, we could start selling mass market products. And once you start selling mass, mass market products, let's say like Corolla, uh, profits will come. So. Uh, this has this been, this been a challenge, a very important challenge, for instance, for Nissan. Nissan is per perceived in Mexico as a very low-cost manufacturer. So Toyota has attempted, I mean, sorry, Nissan has attempted many times to launch premium, pro premium vehicles in Mexico. And when I mean a premium vehicle, I would say a Maxima. A Maxima, for instance, would be a premium vehicle. <coughs> when you are so positioned as a low-cost make, it's very, very difficult to be here. And these products also give you big profits. We decided to go the other way. Uh, it's much easier if you start establishing yourself as a near premium brand, and then it's very easy to sell mass market products. That's where we are, that's what we're looking for little by little, and it's working very well so far. Uh, Long-term advertising strategy. Uh, we, needed, we needed to reshape our strategy. Uh, we needed to make use of the worldwide values, core values of Toyota, and focus also on a long-term strategy. And when I mean worldwide core values, number one value of Toyota in the market is what we call, call QDR, which is basically we sell products with quality, dependability, and reliability, which sounds a little bit boring, but it's, it's been the essence of the brand for many years, even after all what has happened just recently. <laughs> Unfortunately, in Mexico, we were not hit as bad as, as in the US. Uh, but let me, sh let me share with you some of the campaigns. This was a brand campaign. And as you will see, it's mostly focused on, our, on, on the Kaizen philosophy of Toyota. Please see it. I'm sorry, it has no translation. <coughs> Thank you. 
to Yoga Bay Masaya. The last message was basically, uh, it's, it's not about what the, what the ending result will be, will be, but it's about what you do to, to, Im to improve yourself so you can reach that objective. It's, it's a Kaizen, it's a very Kaizen focused uh, campaign. And when I say long term, uh, if, if we needed to sell Corolla, we, may, we put a campaign. But maybe two months after we needed to sell Camry, and we put a campaign on Camry. And three months after RAV4, and you put a campaign on RAV4. That's not the way it has to work. Really, you have to think long term. What identity of your product you want to set, and work on that identity throughout many years. And I want to show you very quickly two stages of a campaign that we did on Corolla that will show you how we reshaped our product strategy into long-term establishment of the identity. This is the old Corolla, of course. <laughs> well, this campaign was very well awarded. When we launched this campaign, when we launched this campaign, we we ramped up sales of Corolla very importantly. But after two years of selling very well Corolla, we had the next challenge. The next challenge was we had a new, new Corolla. What are you going to say of the, your new generation Corolla? And here is the next step of that campaign. <coughs> Si pasamos. ¿Seguro? No está muy hondo. Por supuesto que no, hombre. Claro que vamos a pasar. ¿Qué coche es que vas? Lo único que tenemos que hacer es meter primero y nos vamos a volar hasta el otro lado. Agárrense bien, ¿no? Ok. ¿Sabes qué? Mejor no. ¿Qué pasó? Me lo acaban de lavar. <risa> A ver, a ver, a ver, ¿por qué me pones acá? Yo he cruzado presas, pero el agua era de la mundial, no es Well, in, in the first spot, you, you saw that you have a blind trust for your Corolla. In the second, uh, in the new generation Corolla, we, you still keep that, that trust to the Corolla, but since it's nicer, You'll, you'll take care of it more. So this is very important in marketing. I mean, always keep, plan your strategy on, on, a, on a campaign that, you, that it can evolve throughout many years. Because if you stay, to this, if you, if you stay attached to the, same, to the same communication, that's when really customers will start uh, feeling an identity for the program and for the vehicle and an association with the vehicle. So um, that, this is something that really ch changed for us, uh, th our marketing results, and we have been much better. We have other campaigns that, I, that of course, for the time being, we can, we can share, but uh, it's something very interesting. Three more opportunities, very quickly. On scene service operation, isn't this truth when you, when you look at the sh service workshop that you see everything everywhere, most of the times. Uh, normally, in most mix, uh, dealers do the service operations in any way they understand they have to handle them. There's no guidelines, no training, or, or not appropriate training, and, uh, and that's not the way you should really treat your customers. You have to deliver the same quality uh, service uh, operation everywhere. So this is, this is something like to share uh, for many hours that I'm not going to do now, but Toyota de design 
in Japan, the Toyota production system applied to service. And, and we implemented this in Mexico, adapting it to Mexico, and we had huge results. And basically it has to do with the whole service process, uh, since the maintenance reminder until the follow-up, all the activities you do in terms of Toyota production system applied to the service shop. I will just show uh, some of the examples. This is the, cer the certification. For a customer to be, for a dealer, I'm sorry, for a dealer to become a TSM dealer, they really need to redo the whole service shop. It, it, it has to do with many activities. It starts with only receiving vehicles through appointments, because this goes along with one very important principle of Toyota that is Heyunka, uh, which means you have to balance the workload. If you let your customers come to your shop at any time they want, you will always have peak times and you will always have low, low work times. But if you are able to, uh, to, to bring all your customers through appointment, you can balance uh, throughout the day uh, the, the work, and you can plan for the service you're going to perform to that vehicle. What I mean here is, if, if, you, if I know that your, your Corolla is coming for the 30,000 miles service, I will have the, all the parts needed for that ready. Uh, so as soon as you arrive, uh, everything will be ready to attend you. And so you can leave the workshop perhaps in half hour. So uh, I'm not going to enter into much details, but uh, one good example is the way you handle your inventory. Normally dealers in Mexico, at the time we started implementing this, had inventories of two or three months in their, in their parts uh, uh, and depot. When every dealer we implemented TSM, only had 1.5 or two days of inventory. So the parts, uh, the parts are really clean. Uh, in order to do that, you have to apply just in time. You have to deliver twice a day parts to the dealers. Uh, whatever part they need in the morning, you have to be able to deliver it in the afternoon. And that way, they don't have a need to have inventories, but only the very basic inventory they need. So this is, I don't know if you can see very well this, but it's a huge difference on how you order your parts. Uh, I show you this photo. If you take a look of almost any Toyota dealership in Mexico, you'll see a very clean uh, facility. Uh, this, this, what we call Tablero, uh, I don't know if you have seen that in Toyota production system, most, most of the uh, operation is supported by visual displays. Uh, this is very basic in the Toyota philosophy. Instead, using a lot of technology, uh, you use these this, uh, controls so uh, you, can, you can order uh, the, the, the work level in, in your operation all the time. We will need to explain this in detail some other day, but this is incredible. The, the mechanics, the technicians, sorry, they design based on, 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 what, on how we train them. They design where they store all their, all their tools uh, in the best possible way that they thought it was for them. But uh, the, this is something that doesn't happen really often, that you let your technician order the things the way he wants. And, uh, and they, they did this. I mean, actually, they, if you take out this part, you'll see that there's, a, there's an area where that part has to be. And this is very simple. I mean, everything that has to do with TSM is really simple. But if a, if a tool is missing, you will see what part is because the draw is in the wall. So things like this make a very sound difference in how many tools you lose during, during the year. Talking about other things, uh, visual, a lot of visual indicators. Uh, uh, and with that, I'll jump to opportunity number nine. We established, I said that we were importing parts basically uh, from the US by air. That was really crazy. By year three, we were able to establish a PDC, a part distribution center in Mexico, that was able to deliver uh, in just in time to, to the dealerships, which was the other part of the TSM. Uh, we needed to, to, to support the, the TCM strategy with, with a depot in Mexico that was able to do this. This, this depot has been awarded with many recognitions, 
because it, it, it does a field rate of 97%, which basically means that out, out of all the parts you order in, in, in the month, 97% are supplied on, on, on the same day. So this is very good because it's very difficult to achieve those rates. But once you really order your, your or you put order in your ordering system, it works in a, in a just-in-time basis. It's really easy to, to achieve high field rates. And we basically built uh, a strategic ally alliance with QA and Eagle, and it's working very, very well. And finally, use vehicle program. I'm sure you have been seen a face like this guy. Uh, I think that's the image we all have. And when I came for first time here to Bloomington, I had to buy a used vehicle. And trust me, in every, in every vehicle lot here in Bloomington, you see, you'll see a guy very similar to this. I'm sure, I'm sure you, you have seen that experience. The challenge here is that uh, in the US, if you buy a used vehicle, you can uh, go into a website and, and check the history of that vehicle. And you'll have information about what has happened to that vehicle prior to you having it. The problem is that in Mexico at the time, or, or just until this year, uh, it was implemented a registration system that, where you can start tracking what has happened to that vehicle. But in the past, there was no re registration. So basically, when you purchase a used vehicle, you, you didn't know the story behind that. So what we basically did is we established a program that is called Como Nuevos. Como Nuevos is, stands for like, like new. Uh, in which we basically copied the philosophy of how you sold new vehicles into used into use vehicles. And you have seen this in the US. In Mexico, we apply it a little bit different, but, but it's basically similar. We offer a three year full warranty. Nobody ever in Mexico offered that. I, I am selling you a used Toyota, and I'm providing you the same warranty, three year warranty, as I do with my new vehicles. This was something really new in Mexico. In the same three years, roadside assistance. And the vehicles were inspected in a very, very uh, deeply way, uh, up to 160 points. That trust me, the, the inspection takes about an hour and a half. And the technician that does that inspection has really to get into all the uh, need, uh, into all the components of the vehicle to see that the vehicle really is in very good condition. And if it's in very good condition, you sell it in your lot of Common Nuevos, that you can see that it's a small, it's a small area, but it's a very good looking area. And this, this is very good for us because at the same time, we are telling customers everywhere that come to your Toyota dealer and we will buy your, your, your car. We have huge demand in, at every dealership of our Common Nuevos vehicles. So we are putting a lot of spots uh, in which we tell the, the, the owners of Toyotas, come to sell come to sell your Toyota to us. And this gives you a great opportunity because when, when a customer sells its car to a, to a dealer, uh, it's safe because you know a dealership is a, is a formal institution. And on the other hand, it gives you as a dealer the opportunity that if this guy is selling his car, gives you the opportunity to be able to offer him or her a new vehicle. So uh, it's been a great program for us. And finally, I'll talk very quickly about the results. Uh, what has happened with Toyota in Mexico? This is where the year we started. We have gone up all the way through 2007 with 66,000 units. 08, the crisis in the last quarter hit us. We were, in, by the middle of the year, we were to achieve 70,000 units, but once the crisis hit, it put us down. And in 2009, uh, just to give you an idea, the yen, the Japanese yen appreciated 20%, uh, while the Mexican peso depreciated 30%. Uh, so if you, all the vehicles we were importing from Japan, suddenly their cost went up 50%. So we had to cut productions heavily. In spite of that, this has been the story of our market share from 02 through, through 09. And uh, at this level of market share, we are approaching one of the big five. But it will, be, it will be very difficult to approach that because we don't have a strong manufacturing base yet in Mexico. However, within, within our means, we have been uh, 
quite successful in, in growing year after year. Just talking about some of the vehicles, this is the market share within their segment. Siena has been a huge sound success in Mexico for us. We command the market, basically. Uh, we just launched our new generation Siena. Uh, we are very happy now. Uh, but this is basically the market share we have achieved in some of our products. Uh, this is very important. As I mentioned, we open very few dealers compared to our competitors. As a result, we are the number one sales per dealership or sales per outlet uh, manufacturer. With This is up to 08, with uh, more than 1,000 vehicles sold. Just imagine this, you sold over 1,000 vehicles in average per dealer. You sold at full price without discounts. And, uh, and, uh, and you are, and you don't have, you're not competing, not in service or any other area. Our dealers are very, very, very profitable. Remember that this was one of our major challenges. If our dealers are happy, our customers could be very happy. And this has translated exactly into what we wanted. Our levels of sales satisfaction and service satisfaction are way higher than any competitor. And this green is, since, since so far, we started tracking a dealer satisfaction index that the National Association of Dealers in Mexico started tracking. And we've been, even when you see an 86 and 81, our, the next player is, is below 70. So we, in dealer satisfaction, we, also, we have also we've been very, very high. So, Remember all this, uh, all this we talked about. If your dealers are happy, they, to be happy, they need to make very good money. They need to be free within the market. They need to have certainty. And if they are happy, they will transmit that happiness into the customers. And that's what happened with this. Um, talking about prof dealer profitability, of course, in 08, the, the crisis hit us in the late in the year. and. And, and, and profits went really down that year. But in 2009, in 09, if you remember, we sold way lower volume of, of vehicles in 2009, and our dealer profits went up. And what basically they did, they enhanced their service operations, they enhanced their used vehicle operations, and that helped, us, helped them tremendously in achieving very good results. Finally, I was talking about, I was talking about the certified used vehicle sales. It's a program that is growing, is gain, gaining strength. Could be way higher. The problem is that it's very difficult to buy a Toyota in the market. Normally, uh, customers who have a Toyota, it's very difficult to, to make them sell it to the dealer because normally they sell it to a friend or a relative or a friend or, 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 a, or its cousin or something like that. So it's very, very difficult. But, but, so we're putting a lot of creativity into trying to buy those vehicles back so we can enhance the used vehicle program. Just some photos of facilities. This is Puerto Vallarta. Yeah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Cordoba. This is a, actually a small town in Mexico. And, and if you look at other brand dealerships, you'll see a totally different parameter. But remember, we wanted to establish the brand near premium. We needed to have good-looking facilities to do that. So what's next? The three, uh, three last slides. Just to update you on where we're at right now, we just faced what I said. Yen appreciating 18%, Mexico dep peso depreciating 30%. We had a huge challenge throughout all 09 because we basically had to cut a lot of our imports from overseas. Uh, in addition, when it was January 2010, we said, oh, we're so happy, 2009 is over. And we were just finishing our second month of the year when, when the accelerator pedal crisis just hit, uh, especially the US market. Fortunately, in Mexico, we have been able to, 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 uh, to avoid the same effect. And, and so far, basically, customers in Mexico already forgot that. But it's still making noise, still in the news. So there's still concern in some of our customers. But um, the good thing, even when in Mexico that effect is very difficult to happen, because it has to be in cold conditions that in Mexico we don't have, basically, we still, we already achieved, out of the 30,000 30, units we needed to repair in Mexico, 
will really repair about 70%. And this is a problem that you can translate into an opportunity, into a benefit. Customers say, customers say hey, but why do I have to take the car for, for you to repair the pedal if there's no cold weather in Mexico? Even with that, we insisted to bring the car. On. At the end of the day, that customer is very happy because they, their thinking at the end is, even when, they, when there's a minor uh, failure in the vehicle, these guys will take care of me because we call everybody. So this is translating into, into strength for, the, for Toyota in Mexico, and we hope to capitalize that opportunity. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, Timex, Toyota in Mexico has completed its first stage of positioning the brand, and we have been selling well most of the products. But we're not there yet to become a big five. It's very difficult to, to compete versus these guys. But uh, we, need, we need to produce more locally because the, the Tijuana plant is a small assembly plant that really don't give, do, doesn't give us a hedge versus currency uh, changes. We need, we need a, a plant to, to build subcompact or popular segment, the, the low segment, so we can start competing there when, where there is a big, big market. Uh, uh, we need to increase our production base for hedging. So when the yen goes bad again or the dollar goes bad, bad again against the peso, we have a hedge, a natural hedge. So we, we don't suffer that much. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we are close to securing a plant in Mexico, but that's, we will see by the end of this year what happens. And the last things we, have, we are doing is uh, we just launched the new generation Siena, which in Mexico, trust me, is a major success. Is the minivan every every mother wants to have in Mexico? And <laughs> if you go to the to the exit to the school uh, when the kids uh, leave, you'll see a big line of Sienas. And the one that doesn't have the new generation Siena right now, no, not in style. So they're re really it, it's it's been it's been something amazing what has happened to Siena in Mexico. Uh, we're about to launch Prius. Uh, we haven't been able to launch Prius, but until now. And we are uh, <coughs> planning to launch uh, Lexus in Mexico very, very soon. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Uh, was an hour and a half, right? I hope I left some time to Q&A. How about a hand for Pedro? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I um, wanted to talk about, very briefly, about. Oh, you can just share. Just, just one minute. Uh, when we faced this, this uh, September 11 crisis in, in no one, uh, what I personally did that I want to share with you is it was very clear, especially if you're, if you're not, a, if you're not uh, a US citizen, it was going to be very difficult to, to, be, to attract a recruiter to. Uh, to you. So, uh, even, uh, for, for instance, I wanted to interview with Toyota. I was interested in working for Toyota. I knew they had plans for Mexico, and they didn't want to interview me, to do an interview with me here in, uh, here in, in, in at IU. So what I basically did is I, do, I took a look of, those, of all those companies that I was interested in, and I studied them. What I did basically is, like in the case of Toyota, I, I tried to find uh, how I could be important for them. In the case of Toyota, maybe this was an easier one, but uh, I knew they were planning to come into Mexico. Uh, I tried to get an interview here and they didn't, they didn't want to. So I, I did my research and I researched and I researched and, I, and it happened that I found the name of a vice president in the US who was handling the Mexico project. So what I did with this guy is I sent him a letter telling him how he could, how I could help him, how I could, he could help him, meaning specific actions on how uh, I can help him to launch Toyota in Mexico. Uh, I did this with about three companies. The three companies I did that opened an interview for me. So it's easy to say, it's hard to, it's hard to do it, but please don't forget, Find a way in which you can become essential for that company. 
If you find that spot in which you can help them, that they don't have the people inside or that they, they don't have any other opportunity, they may look at you. So this is only one piece of advice I wanted to share with you. Any? Thanks, Pedro. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. I'm sure before you entered on um, Intermexico, your your competitors knew that you were coming. Can you talk about maybe some of the things that they did in anticipation of your coming? Um, yes. Strategies, advertising, selling strategies that they can play. Well, yes, uh, certainly. One of the first things they did is when they uh, increased uh, the dealer count very rapidly. Even, even when they didn't, didn't need more dealers, in those areas where they thought the representation, the representation was weak, they opened more dealerships, like to, like to, uh, to fill the market uh, with more dealers. I, I don't really know why they did it, but it happened. As soon as we announced we were coming into Mexico, the big five, all of them, started opening more dealerships. Number two, many of the dealer candidates that were interested in Toyota were threatened. They were threatened by our competitors that if they opened a Toyota, they were going to cancel their franchise. This was very, very typical. As a matter of fact, two, two of the owners of the Toyota dealers in the first two years, two of them, had to, had to use a familiar or something so they were the owners, but underneath. Uh, so the, 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 the other manufacturer didn't, didn't take, uh, cancel their franchise agreements. And this was, I'm not going to say names, but some of them even did that. Uh, in the case of, uh, of uh, service, uh, maybe in the US, we, Toyota hasn't, been, uh, hasn't implemented its service strategy. Because the US has its own strategy. But uh, one thing that very quickly we noticed is they all started creating uh, a strategy for attending service. Because they knew we were going to do that. Uh, so they basically uh, took some of the ideas that we did in other markets. Uh, they started uh, giving formality to that service area. Uh, that was another important reaction. And out of that, I think th those will be the most uh, noticeable uh, actions they took. Let me, just one quick thing. We were about to launch Lexus. Uh, we were to, about to launch Lexus last year, but when the crisis, crisis hit in 08, we, di we decided to postpone. When we announced dealers, our dealers, that we were to launch Lexus, they took uh, many actions. Uh, the Germans especially uh, threatened their dealers not to open any any Lexus uh, dealer. Uh, Ac for instance, Acura, Acura, the, the Honda uh, premier brand, came into Mexico and basically copied the Lexus strategy from the US, uh, trying to take those steps before we came into the market. It was very, very, very clear that they were copying Lexus strategy in the US because Acura in the, in the US, is, uh, they have done it differently. So, yeah, we also have been seeing reactions. Another important thing is that uh, uh, the organization that handles the, the manufacturing organization that handles the relationship with the government put also a lot of pressure to the government because we were importing many vehicles. And basically, they said to the government, why you let them import vehicles uh, without uh, tariffs? And we, saw, we, we had to do uh, many challenges there to, but unfortunately the government always supported us because they knew Toyota could eventually uh, put big investments in, into Mexico. So for, fortunately that was not an issue, but if the government had put um, tariffs in our imports from Japan, they, we would be in jeopardy for our uh, midterm strategy. Yes. Um, my question is to you with your market rep strategy. Yes. Um, first, uh, how do you, um, what do you do if, say, a customer wants to buy a vehicle outside their designated market area? Like, how do you enforce that in metropolitan areas? And the, the second part is, um, are you going to do something similar with Lexus, where you have just a small number of dealers mm -hmm. by 
Um, well, to your first question, uh, uh, we customers are free to buy wherever they want. What we don't allow is dealers to do marketing outside their areas. But customers, many, many times they cross shop. Uh, what happens with us is that we are not a push system. We're a pull system. So you always lack, your, you will always have a lack of products in your Toyota dealership. I mean, we never, our inventory levels are about 20 days, 25 days, which is very low versus our competitors that have 60 days. So it's very likely that you as a customer won't find the red Sienna you were looking for at, at your near by dealership. So you may end up in another one. We let that happen. Uh, but uh, what, again, what we don't let happen is uh, the dealer doing marketing somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they, what we have seen is that they have sales reps in other markets. Uh, doing events and things like that. Not necessarily doing events, but doing demos. Uh, very, it's hard to find them, but we have found many of those. Mm -hmm. And when, they, because the, the other dealer notices and they, they complain with you, they give you the evidence. And, <laughs> but, but this is good. I mean, this is good. At the end, they always have the certainty that everybody has to respect their market. Uh, into the Lexus thing. Uh, basically, what Lexus has been a very successful brand in the US. And, uh, and basically, much of what, what we did in terms of market rep of Toyota in Mexico is what Lexus did here in the US. I, I, I strongly believe, and as a matter of fact, I was appointed uh, Lexus. Uh, director, but that, that was not for now. Uh, 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 what we were going to do is basically the same strategy. Uh, BMW and Mercedes-Benz have around 30 dealerships in Mexico, of which maybe 16 or 17 sell five units a month. We don't need that. Really, we don't need that. We were looking for having 12 dealerships that really have a strong uh, profit base and can do business. Basically the same. Um, you talk a lot about your one price strategy, and a lot of dealers in the US are starting to go to the same thing. Well, they would love to do that. Um, but the dead deal is doing independently of the franchise. But what they end up doing is just negotiate on everything else that goes in with the car deal. So the trade in, the warranty, yes. uh, I mean, the financing rate. So how, do you guys try to control that in the dealers? Yes. Or you control it? Yes, we, we do, as a matter of fact. Um, for instance, trade ins. Uh, we have defined a range. Uh, if you go out of that range, because it's very easy to, to go around the one price policy. There are, there are ways, but fortunately, we plan this together with the dealers. The dealers knew all those ways. And basically, we were able to set uh, uh, rules in which we precluded them to do that kind of things. And you say one very important, the trade-ins. If you maintain that within a range, it's okay. But if you give if you buy the vehicle, uh, the used vehicle, way higher, that's where you are giving the discount. Yeah. In in the case of uh, financial fi financing rates, same thing. It's uh, is one uh, nationwide provided by TFS by Toyota Financial Services, so they don't have any advantage over the other the other ones. But you know what? At the end, the first two years, customers complained that we didn't lower prices. But believe me, after a year and a half, two years. They come to a Toyota store without asking deals. And this is, this is just great. Other manufacturers now are, have been trying to do that. They are in their way. But is, since you have many, many dealerships, it's very, very difficult to do it. The other dealer is very close to you. Uh, it, and, and you're competing for the same market. So it's really hard to, to not do it. Thanks. In case of Japanese corporation, uh, headquarters in Japan has a, has a strong power. And uh, what kind of difficulty did you face and overcome in order to get accustomed to uh, Japanese cu culture and mentality? Well, uh, as a Mexican, uh, y you can adapt the culture. Uh, in, in many ways. What is difficult when you're a Mexican is uh, the way the Japanese 
uh, analyze things or plan things is not the same uh, percentage as in, in almost every culture we do. So we are, we are people of operations. We want to take action. But always uh, TMC is asking us for more information, more information, more information before taking decisions. That's always very, very challenging. But it's, it's at the beginning. Once you, you get accustomed to, to think uh, or to see, to see things the way uh, they do in Japan, uh, TMC, it, 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 it gets much easier. Uh, it's just the beginning, I would say. Uh, well, uh, how did yeah. you make the split of the territory? I mean, what was the, the criteria? Because in my personal experience, Mexico has uh, different habits, different logistics, in, uh, depending on what the, the area of the, of the country is. So what, uh, what did you balance? Well, we first looked for a minimum industry volume. I mean, a market had to be of at least 10, uh, let's say 8,000 units. To, to be able to have only one, one owner that makes profits. I mean, if we were looking, normally in almost every market we are at now represented, we do like a 10% market share. We don't do that in total because we are not in many markets yet, but we normally do the 10%. If I know that a Toyota can be successful and very profitable with 600 units, then I, will, I, I start separating uh, territories or areas in markets that are at minimum 6,000 6, units. So it's market share. Market share, basically. <coughs> I know that my dealers can be profitable with 600 units. They, they do very good profits with that. So I wanted to make sure that at least they could achieve that. You had mentioned uh, challenges with getting uh, owners to part with their used Toyotas back in the dealership. Yes. Especially for the, uh, for the like new program. Mm -hmm. What efforts have you uh, undertaken to encourage Ooh. them to? to well, work? many. Uh, we always have a waiting list for used vehicles. Uh, for instance, RAV4 is, for some reason, is huge at used vehicles. Uh, uh, at used, used vehicle uh, demand lists. The, the, we always have customers that are waiting for a used RAV4. So what we do, what the dealers now do is every all the service operations are by appointment. They know what RAV4s are coming in the day. So when that, they know at 12, uh, our RAV4, a white RAV4 will arrive that, that I know is the one that, that they are waiting for. I come uh, to the exit of that service and I talk to the customer, hey, I buy your Toyota. I, I, I will pay you way more than the, than the Kelly book, or how you call it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, will, I will pay you this more than that. Because at the same time, I know that the sales price I have on that other customer is <laughs> way higher. So I go up. The customer gets really surprised. But not, not, not only that, I tell, I tell him, I know you're in, you are paying uh, credit. Uh, I will pay the remaining balance mm -hmm. and, and, and use that as, as your, your, uh, so. your down payment for another, another new wrap. You deserve a new ref, right? <laughs> so, uh, um, so you, they do a lot of things like that. Uh, we are also putting a lot of uh, advertising in the newspaper. We, I want to buy your Corolla. Please, if, if you are thinking of selling your Corolla, come to my dealership. I will pay you. I'll make the com I make the commitment of paying you a better, paying you a better price, uh, a fair negotiation, because I mean, uh, a secure process in which I know that as the old customer. Uh, if I do the transaction at the dealership, uh, it will be registered that I'm not anymore the, the customer. So that's, that provides you security. Uh, and basically, when we launched the Comunos program, we thought, let's sell the Comunos program so we can sell. That was only the first week. Despite the second week, the, 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 the strategy moved into, I want to buy your Toyota, because the challenge is really to get them. And, and most of the customers normally sell, sell them to, again, as I said, friends, relatives. They don't really come very much to, to dealerships to sell them. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, all dealers that are participants in this program have normally, instead of sales force, a buying force, looking in the newspapers, looking at, at uh, 
at uh, auctions, looking at used vehicle lots. Whenever they see one, and it's in good condition, um, and it's one of the products that customers like, they do everything to get it. But it's challenging, it's really challenging. Very active process. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, Professor? I have a quick question. Michelle had her hand up before. In regards to the marketing campaign, when you were launching the brand there, what were the challenges that you faced there? Uh, because you said that the ads were not being successful and the identity were not solid enough, was not solid enough. What, why? What, what, what happened? What do you well, uh, basically, uh, I said that in no one uh, customers think of so something differently from Toyota. After my first year and a half or two of, com of campaign, I was ho we were hoping to, to have only one message from all customers when we did, did the next uh, survey. We basically uh, saw that we were still in the same place. I mean, some customers were thinking we were tr a truck company pickups, some other SUVs. We were not going there. Um, it also had to do that we were represented in only a few markets, uh, of course, that, that, that played f for that too, but, but we were not going um, the way we wanted. We were trying to be many things to many customers. And, then, and what, we, what we ended up uh, concluding is that we needed to be few things so we can really align uh, our positioning in our customers. Is, is that yes. clear? Yeah. I have a uh, question. I'm looking at the, the audience here, and we have uh, several folks who are very interested in international business, and they're going to end up in companies where they, they have to evaluate the Mexican market, right, sure. or in the different lines of businesses. What, what uh, misconceptions have you found that foreign managers have of the U.S. market, of the Mexican market, and what would you like to put, what would you like for them to have in mind as they look for business opportunities in Mexico? Well, the, the first thing we always, well, my experience as a Mexican is that when you when you ask a, a foreigner what he thinks of Mexico, uh, they will tell you also different things because Mexico is not only one. I mean. Especially all the border with the U.S. If you are a Mexican, that's far. That's far. I mean, that, that's like the border of Mexico. That's not where, where your market is. Or, but if you ask a person from California or Arizona that are very close to the border, they will describe very likely the Mexican that lives in the border. And that Mexican that lives in the border uh, normally likes uh, what we call big cars, like in the U.S., likes truck, big trucks, like in the U.S., uh, but that's not most of the market. I mean, as you move south into Mexico, you will, you know it very well. You will start finding uh, more European taste for vehicles, or you will also see that in the cities, in the old cities, ancient Mexican cities, uh, for instance, roads are very narrow, and therefore a Camry will be a big car for for that kind of road. So. Uh, you really, and this is great of the Toyota culture, you really need to study very well uh, what different profiles of customer you have and not come up with only one definition of the customer. I would say that that's very important. And since our, uh, since Toyota Motor Sales is located in, in, Los, in, in LA, they have a perception of Mexico very different. Yeah. What about culturally between the US and Mexico? Well, culturally, the problem with, especially with TMS and us, is that uh, if you go back in history, normally Toyota opened subsidiaries in every country with local people. But that, those local people didn't, didn't look to any other market, but only the local market. So the challenge here is that uh, we had to team with, with TMS USA, which the, which at the end was very good, but was very difficult at some sometimes because they didn't have a global experience. They only knew the local market and it, and it's very difficult for everybody to to uh, trend to the same direction, to look into the same direction uh, when there is when there are totally different uh, perceptions of of what is really going on in the country. 
in the case of the US, great people, great executives, but uh, the, the best way you can see TMS uh, footprint in the launch of Toyota Mexico is that we launch with Camry. Right. It's the best selling vehicle in the US. And Camry was not, design wise, that Camry was not, you agree with me, was not that good. Uh, and uh, it's a car that only for a very small segment of the people. Very small. Yeah. Yes. That question, because it seems like the company had a experience in the 60s. So you're asking them to think again about this strategy four years after that. And it seems like in the very steps of the strategy, they were not so sure about that. They were just get ready to get out as soon as possible to think this is something went wrong. Certainly. How do you work with that? How do you do this? Right. It didn't have to do really with what happened in the 60s, but what happened, the problem at, at the time we launched is that um, we were not sure if we were going to be able to have a plant. If we didn't have a plant, it was going to be very difficult in terms of government, government relations. Uh, number two, uh, the power of the Big Five was very, 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 very big. So we really had fear that they could blockade, <coughs> uh, block Toyota in, in many ways. So there was fear too. Um, we were not clear of the long-term strategy of Mexico at the time. So certainly the first year, you're right. Uh, you could see that if we need, needed to exit the market after year one, we could do it right away. But fortunately, that was not what happened. And, and now we are really uh, invested in Mexico. And it's, it's fortunately a very different story. And as we speak, uh, another plant for Mexico is under study. Hopefully, that will happen. Anything else? Or? Oh, so, thank you, Pedro, very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.